Thank you. We're uh, so I'm going to do a presentation today about multi-sector general permit stormwater compliance. I, now, just as a primer, uh, I prepared this for uh, uh, some contractors, and uh, so most of my uh, multi-sector general permit experience is in uh, working with contractors and their facilities. And uh, so, my uh, it's I'm going to focus really on uh, some the the general permit itself, and then and what it requires, but also uh, some specific roles about gravel, uh, mining, asphalt, and concrete bash plants. And uh, so um, anyway, just kind of tell you where I'm going. It's, uh, I wrote this presentation a while back and then I, I kind of cleaned it up, took some stuff out for the time constraints and stuff. So um, we're, we're gonna kind of talk about the spill prevention in the, in the construction general permit itself. And some dewatering just a little bit there of, of what what's allowed to discharge and, and things like that and then the inspections and monitoring requirements so um so in them in the multi-sector general permit then the epa they break uh i guess i should say too i'm in idaho uh that our deq took over our primacy in july 2021 and uh and they adopted the federal permit uh so we're in Idaho, we use the federal uh, multi-sector general permit. And so that's, for, that's the, all the references or, or anything like that is, is based on the federal uh, multi-sector general permit. And um, so our DEQ enforces it here, but, but we use the federal permit until it expires. So um, the EPA breaks the industrial activities into sectors. And uh, the, like I said, the sector that I'll talk the most about is sector J, D, and E which is uh, gravel mining, asphalt bash plants, and, and uh, concrete bash plants, because most of my clients uh, are contractors, and then they happen to own these facilities, and that's how I started doing multi-sector general permit things. So this few things, is, if you're familiar, I'm assuming you're familiar with the construction general permit a little bit, people listening in on this, um, it's different than that. Instead of focusing on sediment, it focuses on oil and industrial contaminants. So it's kind of a shift in mindset to work in the in the multi-sector general permit field. Um, also, the inspections require monitoring and uh, taking samples to labs and things. We'll talk about that. And then there's an annual report that you submit every year. It's kind of like doing an NOI every year, like a, an annual NOI. And uh, the waiting period for an NOI is much longer. And so a lot of times when I work with contractors and they, uh, you know, if we're trying to set something up and get it going for a specific job then there's a, uh, uh, I guess a, a warning, I guess, is uh, that there's this requirement for a, uh, a uh, longer period that you're gonna be working on in a Y. So uh, what's allowed to discharge uh, from a multi-sector general permit, uh, stormwater discharges associated with the industrial activity uh, for any primary industrial activities that co-located. So you could have, uh, say, a, uh, like I worked on one that was kind of odd and there was this uh, a landfill and then inside the landfill there was a gravel mining operation so those would be two co-located activities and so you'd have to write your stormwater plan to address the the requirements for both those activities um, it doesn't include you can't discharge uh, stormwater that's mixed with process water so in the photograph on the left is a, a wash plant, so uh, a plant for washing aggregates to use. Usually, they do that to, to use them in concrete uh, production. And so, there you can see some water running out of that wash plant on the ground. And if that's mixed with the stormwater and uh, and then it discharges, then you're the, you would be considered to be discharging your process water, which is not allowed. So, so any any industrial activity really in any sector that processes things use process water, you need to. You're not allowed to discharge that. There's a special uh, carve out in sector J uh, for mine dewatering. It's in, just in the, not all mines, but in the uh, uh, industrial sand, uh, uh, crushed stone, construction sand and gravel, industrial sand mining activities, then they, you're allowed to discharge dewatering water without an individual permit. So that's the only sector that, that will allow this. It has to be groundwater. It can't be mixed with any other water, and it, you have to meet the monitoring requirements uh, for that discharge. So there's this special kind of thing there. Um, uh, other allowable non-stormwater discharges are 
in the list here, uh, emergencies, bottled water, landscape irrigation. Right, this is very similar to the construction general permit, uh, but it includes cooling towers, uh, water. Uh, but if it's not in this list, then it's not allowed to be discharged at all. So, so that's a, it's a good way to understand the process water is not in this list, so like wash water of some kind. So washing concrete trucks at a, at a batch plant and stuff like that, that, that water is not allowed to be discharged. The, uh, for mining operations, uh, like the, the gravel mining, uh, then it's grouped into two uh, categories. So there's the earth disturbing activities that are conducted prior to beginning mining. And then there's the active mining that includes the reclamation of the, of the site. And so those are treated a little bit differently uh, by the permit. So uh, really the, the big thing is uh, during the construction phase where you're clearing and grading or removing overburden uh, before the actual mining of say the, the sand and gravel resources or, or rock uh, that you're trying to get to, uh, then you, you basically follow like it's a construction general permit. The, the same rules apply for having perimeter controls, track out controls, uh, stabilization controls, and things like that. That's is very, very, very similar to a um, a uh, uh, construction general permit before you start the mining for a new for a new site. Uh, it also includes that that uh, the state site stabilization requirements uh, that are very similar to the construction general permit, where if a uh, bare soil is left inactive for fourteen days or more, you have to stabilize those those areas, which includes stockpiles of overburden and everything like that. So some special uh, instructions for asphalt batch plants. It, it has this uh, requirement uh, for extra monitoring. You have to monitor for hydrocarbons, which makes sense. Your asphalt is a hydrocarbon. Uh, you know, spilling asphalt and that kind of stuff would uh, maybe increase the amount of hydrocarbons that would leave your site. So you have to collect samples and there's extra uh, monitoring requirements for asphalt batch plants. Concrete batch plants have a couple of extra things that have to be done more than just the general permit. Um, and that's, uh, they have this section in there for, uh, so, uh, so when I reference 8.E.2, point point uh, section eight of the multi-sector general permit is the section that uh, has all the specifics for the individual little, all the different sectors. So uh, if you were a, a sawmill, a lumber, products facility, then you would want to go to that sector and uh, go to and look at the, the requirements just for your industrial activity alone. So hopefully that's helpful of why it's referenced this way. But um, so in, with uh, concrete batch plants and there's requirements to sweep back, you wash down into containment area so you wouldn't be able to discharge wash water, but you, you need to clean spilled or loose cement, fly ash, any other kind of additives that are regular. Uh, to your process, and uh, so that's that's a little bit different than some of the other uh, sectors. So, and you have to indicate how frequently you'll, you're going to do this uh, cleanup efforts in your stormwater pollution prevention plan. Uh, another thing uh, for concrete plants is uh, the location of bag house. Uh, so, uh, bag houses that would receive and transfer, say, cement, uh, lime, or or uh, potash, those kind of things. You would need to locate those in your SWIFT and uh, where they're located at, because then that's a source of dust, uh, spillage, things like that. So, and then you have to document procedures for treatment of wastewater or process water, because uh, this is going to be high pH water, right? You can see in the photo on the left, it's uh, during a storm, and uh, there's a uh, area that's collecting water in the teal blue is a good indicator of uh, the pH is probably kind of high in that, in that water there. So, you have to be really careful at a concrete batch plant and your SWIFT to document uh, how you're containing that kind of water because that's process water and you want to make sure that doesn't discharge with your normal storm water. Uh, there's in the, this is uh, the same for all sectors. Uh, if anything changes, you, you, you do your SWIFT plan and you do your notice of intent. Uh, if it changes, then you, you have to, um, uh, file a new notice of intent. Well, they call it a change in a why, but really it's like filing a new notice of intent. And um, so if acres are added to the facility, you know, that, that happens a lot with mining and, and things where we're, okay, we've mined this out. Now we're going to start using this land over here, leasing another 20 acres of, of, of some property uh, for our gravel production and stuff. And you need to 
that would be a change in a Y uh, if the location of your discharge changes. So I can, <clears throat> I can testify to this with some authority. I've worked with some clients who uh, uh, had uh, inspection and, and a penalty. And one of the parts of the penalty was that the, the, uh, the location where the, the, as the, as the project progressed or the uh, mining progressed and the chain where it discharged to changed. It went ultimately to the same receiving water body, but it was a different path to get there. And, uh, and uh, the, that was one of the parts of the penalty was that the, 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 the discharge location changed. We didn't submit a new NOI form and didn't update it on our site maps in the plant. So, so we won't really be aware of that. And also if your facilities uh, shut down or open, say there's a, it's a seasonal facility, like that happens a lot with smaller mining operations and stuff where they'll, uh, they won't run and the, uh, they need the gravel and maybe, or maybe they'll crush a whole bunch of material and then ship it somewhere else. And then it will, it'll sit there vacant. And that, that's another reason to do a change in a Y form and make sure that, because if you're not operating and then you're not doing inspections and stuff, then there's a, there's a big liability with that. So uh, there's a requirement in the permit to post a sign. Uh, that's uh, it's very similar uh, to what you do on construction sites, but it's a, uh, um, it has a specific language that has to be in the permit that has to be posted at the entrance of the, to the site. Um, I've had experiences with DEQ inspectors and uh, IHO DEQ inspectors and EPA inspectors, and this is, uh, I've seen their checklist and they're very concerned if the sign isn't perfect. So I guess I felt like I should put this in there and make sure everybody understands that you better make sure your postings are up there and ready to go. So, yeah, selecting control measures. This is from the general, or it's the same for all, all the industrial activities. It says that you would uh, select control measures that prevent stormwater from coming in contact with polluted materials, um, uh, assessing the type and quantity of pollutants, including their potential to impact or receive water body. So where do you have stuff that are potential pollutants uh, stored? Uh, can you infiltrate stormwater on site, reduce the amount of discharge that leaves the site? Um, and, or or collection into uh, into ponds. If, uh, you know, I have a lot of a lot of sites that we work on, especially concrete sites. Uh, it's it's a, there's a huge advantage to to making sure that there's no runoff from where the bash plant is and things like that, because you have to test the pH when it runs off. And so, uh, having nice collection facilities is a huge advantage in that in that sector. Um, attenuating flow. So using open swales, using vegetation, those kind of things to reduce the pollutants that could be discharging. Um, that, 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 that's a huge advantage as well. It's just, there's a lot of uh, uh, some older, uh, say gravel pits that we work in that do water uh, when they use the old ponds. Uh, so there's groundwater ponds and when they're pumping their water from the active mining into old ponds and then it flows through those and they become uh, vegetated and and things and it, you really uh, can avoid a lot of risk uh, with those kind of things. So, yeah, and then uh, make sure you conserve, restore, repairing and buffers. Um, yeah. Uh, use grading, berming, curbing to prevent discharges uh, of contaminated flows and divert runoff from these areas. So uh, any, any place that berms can be used to detain water and uh, you can like the photograph there, uh, where the contractor, it's, it's just uh, soil at this point and not vegetated yet, but uh, just right away, you can see how much water is being held and not allowed to discharge from that site, which is, a, and there's a huge advantage to that. Uh, uh, locate materials and equipment activities uh, is for spills, um, uh, you know, uh, they, where they can be diverted before there's a discharge, uh, watch out for leaky vehicles and equipment indoors. You know, I've done a lot of inspections with EPA folks on, on um, construction sites and, and a few on uh, industrial sites. And uh, the industrial sites, they're very particular about the oil storage, uh, more so than the construction. So if somebody has construction experience, I can say like one shift in mentality is like, uh, you really need to make sure your SDS sheets are available. You really need to make sure that your, your uh, storage of any kind of chemicals and, and things is well documented. Uh, it's, it's very important to, from my experience. Um, so, and equipment cleaning operations, that's one thing about industrial sites. A lot of construction sites, we can get away with not washing a lot of equipment. You bring it, you do the job, they haul it away. 
uh, on industrial sites, there's there, you know, the equipment is just there all the time, every day. And so there's a lot more washing, um, you know, maintenance, you, a lot of uh, larger sites will have maintenance shops uh, to maintain equipment and stuff like that. And so then that all that becomes part of your, your, your controls and, uh, and become very critical to the, to your documentation on the site. Um, uh, good housekeeping, sweeping, uh, store materials in appropriate containers, uh, uh, dumpsters and trash and stuff like that. It had, it's very, in this case, it's kind of similar to the construction general permit about covering dumpsters, uh, making sure trash and things like that can't leach into back in the storm water. Um, yeah. Uh, maintenance, uh, you have to maintain control measures that are, that are used to achieve effluent limits. Um, so if you have a settling pond or, or something like that, you need to make sure that it's maintained, it's cleaned out and things like that, that everything's working in good condition. If you have berms, make sure the berms are stable, that they're not uh, blowing out and stuff that's, uh, uh, you know, kind of similar to construction. You want to look for visible signs of erosion, things like that on, on berms. A lot of the mining operations work and they use berms are like the WMP, you have to put berms everywhere and then uh, making sure those are stabilized in, in a timely manner and that there's not erosion coming off of the berms is a really big deal. Uh, so uh, yeah, a maintenance of equipment uh, like uh, and uh, storage areas like this containment you see on the left, um, maintaining non-structural controls, you know, keeping uh, spill kits uh, full of uh, the inspections that I've done with the EPA on M MSGP sites that they always open the spill kits, you know, what's in there? Is there actually material in there? Are you ready to use it? That kind of stuff. Uh, maintenance deadlines. If you find that a control needs routine maintenance, you have to conduct uh, the maintenance immediately in order to minimize pollutant discharges. And then your final repairs should be completed as soon as feasible, but uh, no later than the time frame established by point number three. What it says there is within 14 days or that, it, or, or if it's infeasible, then you can document and then you have 45 days. But, so really uh, uh, maintenance has to be done as soon as possible, but not later than 14 days. If it takes longer than 45 days, then you have to notify the EPA regional office, it says. So I, I, like in Idaho, that would now become the DQ's regional office. So in another state, you know, there's probably some rules about who you notify, but that's, this is what the, the federal CGP says. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, immediately means the day you identify that and control needs to be maintained, repaired, and replaced. So they have a definition for immediately. So, uh, so same day, really. So uh, you have to minimize the potential for spills and leaks and other releases. Uh, you have to conduct spill prevention and response measures. Uh, uh, clean up spills uh, promptly. Use drip ends. Use spill overflow protection. Plainly label tanks and containers, and use secondary containment and keep spills on the site. So in Idaho. Uh, you're supposed to report a spill to the RDEQ if you can't clean it up within 24 hours. That's one of the one of the triggers. And so uh, immediately, yeah, if you can, you need to clean it up right away because technically, if you don't, it needs to be reported as a as a spill that could harm the environment. The or what they say in Idaho, they say uh, the water's uh, ground or surface. Uh, yeah. So SBCC, uh, so they should be a lot of times the industrial facilities that I work for. It's, it's quite often that we there's the MSGP that we're writing, and then there's also an SBCC. So I just left a reminder in here that it's 1,320 gallons. Uh, you count containers or drums that are 55 gallons or more. Uh, yeah, that's how, that's how you come up with do I need an SBCC or not need an SBCC. I'm not going to really go into all the SBCC rules here, but but at least I uh, thought it was good to point out that if you're assessing a new site for an MSGP, well, there's there's uh, maybe one of the check boxes would be does it need an SPCC to go along with this MSGP? And these are these are the kind of the, the most basic. How do you how would I determine that? So, um, when do you report a spill? Uh, it's a national. Uh, uh, I guess rule that if a sheen of water leaves the site on the surface water, 
uh, in our state, we notify our DEQ regional office and a Washington Department of Ecology and stuff, but yeah, you're equivalent. And, and you notify the National Response Center. So hopefully there's any spills, they're contained on site, you clean them up uh, right away. And then that, that would uh, save you from the having to report and then write written reports about what, what happened and why. So uh, in the CGP or in the MSGP, sorry, I've been doing CGP training for the last couple of weeks. So I'm having a hard time switching my mind. But uh, employee training, you have to train all employees who work in the areas where industrial materials or activities are exposed to stormwater. So basically everyone, right, would have to have received some kind of training. And uh, it, it gets a little bit more specific about uh, how you document that and, and with who. Uh, so it could be... Uh, the way that I read it, and, and then my interpretation, I guess, is that the, all these, these employees would have to be trained, and then the supervisors would need to have more specific training. Um, so it says here, uh, personnel must be trained at least the following. Now, this is out of the MSGP, by the way, uh, related to the scope of their job duties. So it says only personnel responsible for conducting, conducting inspections need to understand how to conduct the inspections. And uh, But the minimum training requirements are here overview of what's in the SWIP, uh, spill response procedures, uh, maintenance requirements and material management practices, the location of all the controls required by the permit and how they <clears throat> are to be maintained and the proper procedures to follow with respect to the permits pollution prevention requirements. So when how you conduct inspections and uh, the emergency response procedures, uh, if applicable. So. So they give a quite a detailed list of what need to need to be trained, and uh, there's a requirement for an annual training uh, for those personnel. So the reason that this presentation exists is that I had some uh, some of our clients said, "What can you do this for us?" And uh, and so I put together a presentation for them uh, to try to cover these things. What I did remove was all the site specific, like what is in their SWIP. Uh, we had had a bunch of information about that. And we took that out. Uh, for this uh, for this presentation, but um, yeah, and then we had some other site specific things about that company and their, their kind of procedures too. I took those out. So uh, dust uh, tracking, you have to minimize the generation of dust. Uh, yeah, not uh, not a big uh, surprise there. Uh, process water, you emulate, it says specifically eliminate non stormwater discharges not explicitly authorized. So we went. I showed you already the list of. Uh, of non-stormwater discharges. And uh, it, this includes equipment, vehicle equipment, tank wash water, things. So, so this is a, uh, uh, a clarifier uh, to recycle water and it has discharges that are heavy, heavily laden in sediment. So it, it, it goes into a containment pit and, and then uh, that is cleaned out regularly, but separated from where it could discharge from the site. Adam, um, real quick, there's a question about its annual training question mark. So, and I, I think you answered it, but I just want to verify. Yeah, yeah. In the in the MSGP, then it uh, then it requires that the training uh, be at least once a year um, for for all the the people at the site. So, like, a, uh, what I've done is helped the contractors receive enough training so that they can train their other people and. Uh, and uh, that's that's usually what they what they need from us. So, <clears throat> so we, we talked about the dewatering already. Sorry, it's a little redundant there, but uh, and I just keep emphasizing the process water. That's probably the biggest way to get uh, a, a penalty is mixing process water with your with your with your storm water. So, uh, um, uh, the the dewatering water it would have to meet the state water quality standard. That's what it says in the permit. Um, uh, in, in Idaho, it's it's a uh, 50 NTUs over the background. So so in the previous photograph where that water is discharging into a uh, a drainage, so you know that that would be your background, and then, and then your uh, uh, dewater and water could be 50 NTUs over that. Um, there's also other monitoring parameters. We're going to go over those in detail here in just a minute. Um, but this is some an example of one of those tests from a lab. And uh, it would take a sample, nitrogen, pH, and total suspended solids was all that was required at this time. Uh, but I'm going to go to uh, um, the inspections and monitoring. So I think this is probably the toughest part of the of the the managing the site for most people 
is under, trying to understand the inspections and monitoring and uh, what comes out of these and uh, how to document on a site and things like that. So, so that, you know, have a little bit of uh, detail here about how, how this should be done. The new, uh, so this permit was issued in 2021, I think in, in March, um, was active in, in May. And uh, so you're, uh, um, there's uh, some things in here too that are kind of new. I mean, just say about a year old that are a little bit different if you've done MSGP things in the past. So uh, first there's a quarterly uh, routine uh, facility inspections. So that's the inspection schedules that you do an inspection once a quarter. And so you do it sometime during that quarter, uh, hopefully to capture a discharge event. And uh, so the inspections would be done usually during a rain event uh, for some kind of precipitation event where you're getting a discharge. So you do the inspection and, and collect the water. You could do the inspection and collect the water on a different day. Um, just depends on the, how, how that's done, but you'd uh, but that's that's a quarterly. The the quarters are just regular calendar quarters, um, so you don't have to try to figure out. Well, I got my NOI active on September, so I start my quarters on this day. No, you just you just follow the first full quarter after your NOI is active. That's that's when you start your your first uh, quarter inspection. So, um, yeah. Uh, what you inspect, you have to inspect all the areas where industrial materials or activities are exposed to stormwater uh, areas, identifying the SWIP, that are potential pollutant sources uh, where spills, leaks have occurred in the past three years. So you have to start documenting if you have any spills, which is, uh, I guess, uh, adds another layer of complexity there. Uh, then discharge points anywhere where the water leaves your site, and then any control measures that you use to comply with the with these uh, effluent limits. You inspect all those things. And uh, during the inspection, uh, the, the permit specifically asks to look for certain things, industrial materials, residue trash, leaks. Um, uh, that could be from equipment or tanks or any kind of containers, could be small buckets and, and things as well. Uh, any offsite tracking um, and uh, any tracking of, or, or that should be ore blowing of stockpiles. Uh, or any kind of waste, uh, any erosion, uh, non-authorized, non-stormwater discharges, and any control measures that need repair. So, the, you know, it's pretty, pretty, I don't know. I think that not reading this and then going and doing an inspection, somebody who's used to doing inspections, you probably wouldn't miss any of these things anyway. So um, uh, if there's, during a stormwater discharge, it, you must observe control measures implemented to comply with the permit limits. Uh, observe discharge points uh, during the inspection. If such discharge locations are inaccessible, you have to inspect nearby downstream locations. So you check the discharge, make sure that it's meeting their state water quality standard and things that document those things. So we'll get to the monitoring part here and it gets a little more specific, but uh, uh, any facility that receives snow, it says at least one quarterly visual assessment has to capture snow melt discharge. So if you have a facility that's anywhere where it snows, you want to say the springtime, I guess, when the snow is melting, uh, you need to do at least one inspection during a snow melt event. Um, then uh, visual assessment. So part of your inspections uh, process. And so uh, you could do the inspection and then go back and do this visual assessment and collect your samples for your monitoring. Uh, but normally it's convenient to do it all at once. Uh, but you perform a quarterly visual assessment and uh, you try to do the inspection when there's runoff. So you put the water in a clear jar and you fill it up and there's, you look at the water and then you document on that. There's actually in the EPA SWIP template, there's a form, that, uh, a, a template form that they have for doing this visual assessment, formally documenting that you did the visual assessment. So what you're doing really is visually screening uh, the the water for for pollutants, and uh, it also one of the things too is any odor. So you if you can smell it too. So I guess not completely visual. Some some of it may be smelling. So, uh, but yeah, uh, this is what you're documenting for uh, in that visual assessment. That has to be one, done once a quarter as well. And in the CGP or the MSGP, sorry, we did it again. 
And then in, they require an annual report. So you do this online through the NOI system. Uh, you, uh, um, it's basically like going back, uh, doing another NOI, and then you put in that kind of information, uh, but then uh, reporting on everything that happened that year. So your quarterly reports, uh, you put in your SWIP, keep them on site so they can be reviewed if you have an inspection, but you're not submitting those quarterly reports. Uh, you submit monitoring reports, but not the actual visual inspection reports. So you can keep those. And then at the end of the year, in your annual report, you would document things like corrective actions that you did, changes in the facility, any monitoring results and stuff like that. You put those in your annual report. So if you did a said, well, we now this this wasn't working, we made our sediment basin in this part of the um, facility uh, twice as big and stuff. Those are the kind of things that you would write into this annual reports. So without doing the quarterly reports and having a record of those, you're going to be really have a rough time doing the annual report. So and this would be based on you, you would do your uh, uh, fourth quarter inspection and then you have 30 days. So January, uh, I think you can do it before then. Like if you did your fourth quarter inspection the first of December, you can do it before that. But the deadline is the, the January 30th of the following year. So uh, so then there's monitoring. So there's the inspection, I'm going to break it into categories here. You've got the inspection, you have your visual assessment, which is your screening if there's pollutants, and then you have your actual monitoring. These are the lab tests that you do. And so there's, uh, and I, I, I got to admit that I, when I first saw this new permit, I, I was just kind of shaking my head because a lot of the people I work with have a hard time uh, just with the monitoring and getting that done. And then they, uh, this this newer permit uh, has like more and more, seems like more and more monitoring. So I tried to break it down here into the um, types of monitoring that are required. There's indicator monitoring, benchmark monitoring, annual monitor, effluent monitoring, state and tribal specific monitoring, your impaired waters monitoring, and then any other monitoring required by the EPA. So the, the sixth one is not very common. I don't have any projects that are required to do that. Uh, but I, in the past, I have got some things from our state that said, hey, because you discharge into this water body, you have to take, you have to uh, um, test for this parameter. One of them was pesticides. It was a really expensive test to run the lab, but they, uh, there was an impairment in that water body. We have a lot of agriculture land around here. So there's an impairment for some uh, kind of pesticide. And we had a test for pesticide residue running off of our, our industrial facility. So, so that's the kind of thing there. But let's go through these indicator monitoring. Um, uh, oh, yeah, the, sorry, I should, I, I read through this, but I didn't clean that up very good today. But uh, if your facility uh, mines industrial sand, so this is like indicator monitoring, how do I explain it, is, um, is more specific than just the sector specific. And so what you're looking for is indicators of a certain type of pollutant. There's no limits for these. This is more like the, the EPA is looking for data that would indicate that these pollutants are concerned based on a specific uh, subcategory. So, so if the facility doesn't mine industrial sand, if you're just an industrial sand and gravel, like a uh, road base and that kind of stuff, industrial sand would be like sand blasting sand or, or Ottawa sand or uh, things like that they use in like say well construction or, or, uh, or granules for something, you know, uh, that, you're sh that you're shipping. Uh, so that, that's a little bit different than construction sand and gravel. But so anyway, uh, if you mine industrial sand, there's extra monitoring that you do. If, if you use coal tar emulsions on any paved surfaces, you would use that like as a sealer. Um, it's, it's really uncommon to use coal tar emulsions in the West, um, but, but that, that would be more indicator monitoring for uh, gravel pits. Uh, for asphalt plants, uh, uh, same with uh, coal tar emulsions. Uh, but since you, if you produce asphalt paving materials, that's usually what I'm doing these for, it's asphalt paving materials. So there's other asphalt products like um, or shingles for roofs and things like that, but I've, I have more experience just in the paving facilities. Um, but you, because of that, you have to monitor for the, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So basically doing a hydrocarbon test uh, from those facilities. So that's indicator monitoring, no limits or exceedance. Uh, what the, this is what I understand from talking to EPA people about this permit is that they wanted to get an idea of 
if these are flutes of concern in the future. So um, uh, concrete plants, uh, um, again, the coal tar um, it has a requirement, but if you don't use those, then uh, you'd only have to do this if you produce uh, glass hydraulic cement, um, like a, a cement manufacturing and things. So if it's just a construction concrete batch plant, then you don't have indicator monitoring from concrete plants. But if you do one of these other activities inside, so the, the, when you get into sector specific stuff, it gets into very specific subsectors and making sure that's documented well in the SWIFT is really important. So benchmark monitoring, move on from the indicator monitoring. Uh, all, all the industrial activities have benchmark monitoring. It doesn't matter if you're involved in construction materials or not. Um, uh, so the, you have to do this uh, uh, quarterly for full four full quarters of a year, and uh, and then year year one and year four. So if you're familiar with the old permit, then it said uh, it was just the first year, and now it's year one and year four of the coverage. So if you have your regular stormwater runoff, uh, we that's southern Idaho where I work. It's it's pretty. Uh, we have a semi-arid climate. It's very dry. And um, we we uh, all of our sites have a regular run. Uh, so you modify the quarterly schedule, uh, provided that this revised schedule is reported to the EPA in your first sample that's collected and reported. So you, um, it's just it's tough uh, to get samples where we are. We're constantly having to explain to the to the our DQ in way we're constantly explaining to them why there's no sample here and you know things like that because. The facilities are so different. Some of them can get a discharge and we can get sampled all the time and some of them just don't. So uh, this is the benchmark monitoring parameter. So it used to be that it was like three or four things. And uh, after last year, there's a whole list of these are these are the samples that you test from. And I took out the, the little notes about salt water because I, I work inland. But if you work on the coast, you'll want to go into the permit and read this. Um, because it has different thresholds for salt water uh, on a lot of these. Uh, I, I just took those out and just have the fresh water here. So these are the, these are the parameters. These two slides have the full list of stuff that you monitor for in every quarter for that year one and year four. So and we'll talk about if, the, if you exceed these parameters, uh, what, what you do. So effluent limit monitoring, uh, this is... Um, in uh, sector J, this is only applies to if you're dewatering. Uh, if you're not dewatering, it doesn't apply. So these are very, uh, effluent limit monitoring is very sector specific. I'm just using gravel here as a, or gravel mining as an example. And, um, but uh, they, uh, well, some of the industrial activities don't have effluent limits. Uh, some do, and some like gravel mining, it only applies if you're doing this or if you're doing that. And so you need to be really careful about those, but that's, the effluent limits is, a, is an annual uh, test that you do. Um, so and then there's uh, sector specific benchmark monitoring. Uh, so this is something you do every quarter, but a lot of times I've noticed that these, they, they are written into the sector and then you go look at the total benchmark and they're the same. So, or, or they will say 50 milligrams per liter for the regular benchmark, but because you're um, asphalt materials, you have to be below hundred. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, and the concrete product manufacturers uh, have a total of suspended solids of 100 milligrams per liter as well requirement. Uh, so other things for the effluent limits uh, only applies to asphalt emulsion facilities. So that would be uh, the liquid asphalt that you're putting down, like seal coats on the surface or tack coats underneath before you start paving and stuff like that. So it's a facility that batches that kind of stuff. Then you would you would have effluent limiting monitoring. Otherwise, in asphalt plants, you don't. Uh, uh, in sector E, which is the concrete plants, uh, only applies to cement manufacturing facilities. Um, so ready mix concrete or or uh, and, and those kind of facilities are different. What they're talking about there is like a precast yard, uh, precast facilities and stuff like that, where you're manufacturing cement products uh, at the facility. So. So impaired waters monitoring. So if the water body that your facility dump, trains into or your stormwater discharges to, if it's impaired for something, uh, then you would uh, uh, 
you have to take samples for that parameter. So we're kind of, I've done work uh, for years on a project here in Idaho and it discharges to a creek that's called Lake Fork Creek. Lake Fork Creek is impaired for dissolved oxygen. So I have to take a sample and test it for dissolved oxygen. So this is uh, done annually, uh, the first and uh, um, fourth year of the permit coverage. So I'd have to, on that facility, uh, since it discharges into that water body, I have to get that sample uh, at least once a year. And then there's state travel specific monitoring. So the Idaho DQ, when I say the DQ, sorry, I just truncated that because I really prepared this for a contractor that works here in Idaho, but um, the, the, they send an email instructing us what, what additional parameters. I used the pesticides example earlier. So um, yeah. And most of the time we don't have these as part of our facilities, but it exists, it's possible. Um, so if you have irregular stormwater discharges, like I suppose uh, uh, south, uh, southeast and eastern uh, Oregon and Washington should be about the same. Uh, um, you can modify your quarterly schedule, you report it to uh, the EPA, in our case, the DQ, and then uh, we have to keep the revised schedule in the SWIP and then when conditions prevent us from obtaining our four samples in our four consecutive quarters, we have to continue monitoring until we have the four samples. So that's usually what we usually are monitoring for a longer period of time because we might be able to get one sample a year on some of these sites or two samples in a year. And so we're doing more samples. And when we have four samples, we can start comparing to see if, if we can not do these. Uh, so basically you have to get four samples from your benchmark monitoring and then uh, and uh, if that if they are below the parameters, the, then you can stop monitoring until the fourth year. Uh, but if they're not below the parameters, we have to keep monitoring. So uh, the data has, you, you should save the data uh, um, and be ready to report that. You enter it each quarter into the, the DMR system. So I, I, I know that Washington has a DMR system. I'm not as familiar with Oregon, but... Um, uh, our state uses the, the federal DMR system still because they haven't finished getting theirs ready. But um, yeah, you, you have to put them in within 30 days of receiving the test results from the laboratory. And then you, that's, your, that's your deadline. Um, if the discharge exceeds the numeric limit, so uh, then, we, then we need to uh, indicate an exceedance uh, on, a, on a change NOI form, it says. Um, uh, so, um, so we put that into our, uh, uh, anyway, you go into the NOI system and, and indicate your exceedance there, report, report that. Then you conduct a following up monitoring within 30 days or, or during the next storm event. So this, this is where we deal with a lot in a similar area is that, well, we barely, we barely eked out a sample and now we have to do another sample and it's, six months later or a year later, and then our DQ is often, it's just a constant communication uh, thing for us. But uh, um, so you, you have to submit an exceedance report, uh, continue to monitor uh, when you're back in compliance and you submit another change in a Y form. That's what the permit says we, we have to do. Uh, so maintenance and corrective actions. Uh, so switching from the monitoring over to what how you maintain the BMPs and and so they, they have three categories. There's maintenance and there's corrective actions and then there's this AIM system. So if anybody makes comments on the draft CGP, if they ever asked to do AIM things in a construction general permit, then, then submit a comment. No, we don't want to do that. Because <laughs> it just, there's a, you'll see here, we'll, we'll talk about it. So there's a, there's a, it's complicated. There's a lot of bad issues there. So, so if, uh, if, what if, uh, if maintenance is something that you can, you, we can maintain that. You can get it done within their 14-day time frame. So what if, when it's not just maintenance, these are the, the five things that say it has to be a corrective action. Unauthorized discharge, release or discharge. Discharge violates the numeric limit. You have to do a corrective action. Uh, your stormwater control measures are not stringent enough uh, for your discharge to be controlled as necessary. Uh, so the receiving water, oh, the receiving water of the United States will meet applicable water quality standards or meet the non-numeric effluent limits in this permit. So, so you would, I, I know my BMPs aren't good enough. I have to do a corrective action even without the test, I guess is what they're saying. 
uh, a required control measure was never installed or installed incorrectly or not in accordance with these parts. So those are, those are the parts about the controls and what they're supposed to do and things like that. Uh, or, it's, or it's not being properly operated or maintained. So, um, it, 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 you know, this statement here makes you think, well, when does maintenance not a corrective action, right? But um, it, you're going to have to use your judgment document. Uh, whenever a visual assessment shows evidence of pollution, so the color, odor, floating solids, settled solids, some foam, uh, then you, your, your visual assessment, water, jar, and you look at it and you, you do a corrective action based on that as well. So. So any kind of indicator of pollutants, basically, or potential pollutants, uh, because it doesn't look like your VMPs are good, you call it a corrective action. Uh, so what do you do? You do the work on the site, you update the SWIP, and then you complete the corrective action report and put it in the SWIP. So that's the basic, what, what you have to do to say my corrective action is completed. Um, you immediately take reasonable steps. You complete before the next storm event, if possible, and within 14 calendar days from the time of discovery. The same thing applies as with the maintenance it says you can't make it 14 days document and uh, complete within 45 days. If you can't make the 45 day schedule, you need to re report it to your EPA or, or your DEQ in our case, and probably your case, uh, regional office. So, uh, if the event triggering uh, the review is a permit violation, so that's non compliance with effluent limit. So, that's why effluent limits are different than benchmark monitoring. And things here, you know, the, the words that they're using are very important. Uh, with the SLO limit, correcting it does not remove the original violation. Uh, additionally, failing to take corrective action in accordance with this section is an additional permit violation. So that kind of tells you why ethylene limits sometimes are the same as the benchmark monitoring, because um, if it's an ethylene limit, it's a violation. And so you could have the same numeric parameters, or like, why am I? I mean, I could do one test and I satisfied my effluent limit and my benchmark monitoring, but the difference is, is that when it comes down to maintenance and what you're doing, then the, the effluent limit is a violation of the, of, of you're out of compliance, I guess. So that's the way that I read the permit, seems to be logical. So what is an aim? So I have my maintenance and I have my corrective action. So what is an aim? The, if an annual average exceeds, so that's your annual average, your benchmark monitoring, and you take your four samples, if that annual average uh, exceeds the applicable benchmark threshold uh, based on the following events, the aim requirement have been triggered for the benchmark parameter. So one is the four quarterly annual average for a parameter exceeds the benchmark, and two, the exceedance is mathematically certain. So uh, if you could have, if you were so far out of whack, say it's a one milligram per liter or something, and then you got a hundred, and so three zeros of the average is still going to be mathematically certain. You start the aim right away. You don't wait till the end of the year and you got all four samples to, to back it up. So, so that's, that's all they're trying to, to say with number two there. So, so anytime that you're at that average of the annual average is over the benchmark uh, parameters, then you go into this additional implementation measures. And so there's three levels of aim. And uh, so uh, uh, level one, two, and three, you must respond to uh, different aim levels. So we'll talk a little bit about what the different levels are. Uh, I'm going to I've, I'm going to finish this on time. This is there's a lot of text and a lot of uh, detail here, but uh, this is uh, I think we can finish on time here. We're almost done. So uh, your status changes from baseline level one. If your quarterly benchmark results indicate the aim tree event, the event is you're over the average, right? So you have to review your SWIP and stormwater controls and plant implement additional measures that would reasonably expect to bring the exceedance below the benchmark. So you need to document this on your SWIP drawings and, and probably a little bit of write-up and stuff and document what, what is my aim uh, level one going to do. I test again. If the parameter is below the limits, then I return to the baseline status. If it still exceeds the limit, then I proceed to aim level two. So I go to level, level two because I tried something and it didn't work. And uh, I still, I'm still exceeding the limits. I worked with a metal manufacturing facility and they had, it was aluminum and it seemed odd that it wasn't iron, but there's aluminum and something else that they kept going over. We put in a whole bunch of booms and things that were to help uh, collect the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, metals out of the water. And then they were still over the limit. It came down about half, but they were still over the limit. And, um, 
And then that, that was where they started going into, okay, let's build some ponds. Let's, uh, let's have more detention here on our site before the water discharges and stuff like that. And that's, that's where they were headed. Um, so, so anyway, that was used to happen, I think, but now it's very formal in a way that you would document, well, I'm in aim level one, two, or three. So what is two? Uh, it goes from one to two if you continued, right? So you have to, it's a little bit different about what you must do is the difference. So uh, review your SWIP, implement additional pollution prevention, good housekeeping, uh, uh, stormwater control measures, SCM stormwater control measures, considering good engineering practices, beyond what you did in level one. So in my case, we installed some booms and then level two was we were starting to design swales and stuff. And I, that they sold that plant and I never actually finished, uh, but that, that was kind of where we were going, right? That, so that was beyond level one. Level one was uh, some pretty simple BMPs that we can incorporate in their existing system. And then level two was we were changing the system. Uh, uh, so then, uh, you you should be reasonably expected to bring your exceedances below the parameters, the benchmark threshold. You test again, so you implement those within the the deadlines, and then you test again. And if you still are above the limit, then you go to aim level three. So aim level three is the same, right? The status, but it says you must install structural source controls at this point. So they're getting more serious, right? Uh, permanent controls such as permanent cover, burn, secondary containment, treatment controls, so sand filters, hydrodynamic separators, oil water separators, retention ponds, uh, infiltration structures, you know, things, you're, you're getting serious now. You're the, I think if you're watching this, you're probably thinking like, wow, this, they're asking me to spend a lot of money. And that's, that's exactly right. That's how I read the permit too. So, uh, uh, and, then, and then at A level three, you would, uh, uh, they, they should be beyond what you did in, in level two. And uh, yeah, so uh, it either works and you return to baseline or you stay at the level three status and you continue to implement structural controls. Um, what are the deadlines? It's the same really um, for aim level one and two, you have the 14 days. And then if you can't get done in 14 days, you, you document and you go to 45 days. And if you can't get done in 45 days, you need to, notify your, your DQ. Uh, but if you go to aim level three, you, they give you 60 days. I mean, and that kind of coincides with, I think, uh, these major structural controls. So if you were uh, trying to engineer something and then get that approved and then bid and then have somebody come in and install something, 60 days is a pretty tight time frame. But, but anyway, that's, uh, that's what's allowed for deadlines. So, uh, and then your SWIP, just a note about the SWIP itself. It has to be on site and needs to be up to date at least every quarter you'd be uh, keeping up. So mining, uh, gravel mining and stuff is a constant thing because they keep, they'll move on and mine more and you're constantly updating those kind of things. The batch plants and stuff, uh, manufacturing facilities and stuff, they change, you le less updates. That's been our experience anyway. Um, and it have to contain the inspection reports, the visual assessment reports, and your annual reports, your 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 monitoring reports. I, I don't have that listed in there, but the monitoring uh, data should be in there as well. And you should you should be able to produce that at a time of an inspection at the site. So so anyway, that's my uh, I don't know how I did here, but yeah, I got two minutes to go. And I'm ready for some questions. If you guys have any questions. And um, everybody can go ahead and unmute if you would like to ask a, qu ask a question. Yeah, I know that was pretty quick uh, overview there, but that's, it sounds like the, to me, the biggest thing that people have tried to keep on top of is um, understanding that corrective actions versus aim and stuff that's brand new uh, in this federal permit. So. Adam, if, um... If somebody thinks of a question after the presentation, can they email you or call you? Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, hey. Could you put your info in the uh, chat real quick? And yeah, I'm doing that right now. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any questions, um, let's go ahead and uh, we'll end the session. I want to thank you all for attending. And again, this presentation has been put on.
by the Pacific Northwest Chapter of International Erosion Control Association. Thank you very much to Adam. Uh, great presentation and hope to see you attending future events. Please check our website for upcoming events. Thank you all. Thanks, Dave. All right. Thanks, Adam.